Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome today to today's episode of Paideia Today. I'm Scott Masson here with my esteemed colleague, Bill Friesen. And for today's episode, we are going to look at Franz Kafka. Uh, Kafka is a famous German novelist of the early uh, 20th century. When I say he's German, he's actually born in and lives in Czechoslovakia, what we would now called the Czech Republic at that point, Bohemia, part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire uh, in Prague. And uh, that identity as a, a Jew in Prague, uh, writing in German, are all integral parts of uh, not only his own identity, but the way in which he relates uh, that identity to his novellas. And today's episode, we'll be looking at the Metamorphoses and we will uh, talk about that a little bit further, but I'm going to hand over to my colleague Bill, who's going to read us an extract from the Metamorphosis and uh, say whatever he'd like to say on that as an opening gambit. Bill. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, uh, the first thing I should do here is to vent my spleen. Mm. Um, as Dr. Masson knows, I was kicked into this, uh, kicked and dragged into this uh, particular podcast uh, with uh, uh, over my violent protests. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Kafka, though I have to admit that he is fascinating. But to me, he's kind of fascinating, like a, uh, a traffic accident that you drive past. That's uh, the sense in which I see Kafka. Um, but uh, this is all uh, done, no doubt, to balance out uh, my demands that we discuss uh, Sylvia Plath at a later date. And so... No, no, no. Um, <laughs> So let me just dive straight into uh, the first couple of paragraphs from The Metamorphosis. One morning, as Gregor Samsa was waking up from anxious dreams, he discovered that in bed he had been changed into a monstrous, verminous bug. He lay on his armor hard back and saw, as he lifted his head up a little, his brown arched abdomen divided up into rigid bow-like sections. From this height, the blanket, just about ready to slide off completely, could hardly stay in place. His numerous legs, pitifully thin in comparison with the rest of the circumference uh, of his circumference, flickered helplessly before his eyes. What's happened to me, he thought. It was no dream. His room, a proper room for a human being, only somewhat too small, lay quietly between the four well-known walls. Above the table on which an unpacked collection of sample cloth goods was spread out, Samsa was a traveling salesman, hung the picture which he had cut out of an illustrated magazine a little while ago and set in a pretty gilt frame. It was uh, a picture of a woman with a fur hat and a fur boa. She sat erect there, lifting up in the direction of the viewer a solid fur mu uh, muff into which her entire forearm had disappeared. So there we are. Of course, this is a translation of the Metamorphosis, originally written in German. Um, I should note here that, like so many of these authors that we've been looking at, uh, Kafka was very gifted when it came to languages. Uh, he learned German at a younger age, um, largely under pressure by his um, relatively authoritarian father. Uh, he also later learned French. He learned Yiddish. Uh, he learned ancient Greek. Um, the list goes on. So he has a lot Hebrew. of languages under his belt. Uh, Hebrew, yes. Um, and so a very, very gifted man when it came to languages. But he had great difficulty in his lifetime actually deploying that linguistic skill in artistic form because much of his time was taken up, of course, working as an insurance lawyer uh, in Prague. Um, and uh, this was a job apparently that he was rather good at. Uh, but he resented it deeply and bitterly and complained oftentimes uh, about it. Um, I will admit that Kafka actually is worth studying and knowing about uh, for, amongst other reasons, simply because uh, he represents in particularly dramatic forms what I consider to be some of the most idiosyncratic aspects of the modernist worldview. Um, he captures the absurdity of the modern experience. He captures the nihilism of the modern experience, the uh, alienation, uh, the pointless suffering of modernist uh, life. Um, he catches this and he oftentimes dramatizes this in the form of frightening bureaucratic quests and things like this. Uh, and here with the metamorphosis, very specifically, 
with this notion of monstrous transformation, uh, which becomes, uh, again, one of the things associated with many of his narratives, whether you're reading The Penal Colony, uh, The Castle, uh, The Trial, um, The Hunger Artist, um, the, this, this sense of transformation and horrific transformation is kind of a subtext that inhabits in many different ways many of his stories. So in that sense, he's a fascinating object of study. Uh, Dr. Masson. Did you have something right at the front end you wanted to add to your impression of Kafka, Kafka overall? Aside from my masochism um, in, uh, or my sadism in uh, inflicting this upon you. Uh, well, I, I think I, I'm the one who chose this one. Uh, Bill has had his choices in this uh, series. We found it more difficult when we came to the season four to agree on who we would deal with in large part because the choices are in abundance, but, but also simply, and the languages from which we could choose, but also the uh, difficulty in seeing clearly and agreeing on what would constitute the best writers, we've left uh, a lot out, as we have over the course of all the centuries, really. But here it becomes more problematic. But I, I wanted Kafka on here uh, for the same reason, I think we would agree that it was worthy to put Orwell on here and Flannery O'Connor on here. Um, and we could add others and we will add others into that mix as well. It seems to me Kafka describes, as you say, the modernist condition of, of alienation. Uh, and he does so in a memorable fashion. I, I think one of your objections, Bill, is that he is... Uh, stylistically not great. Uh, he's not a great prose stylist. He's no Thomas Hardy. Uh, he's no Jane Austen. He's no uh, T.S. Eliot, for that matter. And he's no Flannery O'Connor, really. But what he does is he conveys images and ideas uh, in a way that uh, few others do. And, and uh, for that reason, we use the adjective Kafka-esque, just like we use the adjective Orwellian. There is a mental image that's been conveyed in Kafka's fiction, which makes him uh, instantly uh, recognizable. And when, he just, when, when we use that phrase, other people know what we mean by that mental image. And so I think Kafka uh, does that, and he does it for a variety of reasons. So one of them is the common human condition of which we spoke and the common human experience. But he reflects that through his own identity in a way which um, is much more convincing and it's partly because of his biographical details as i said he is a jewish uh, writer uh, born in uh, prague which is arguably the most beautiful city in all of europe a place where jews had uh, set up uh, residence and had a community there for, since at least the 10th century a long-standing uh, presence there um, and yet he's not writing in Czech. He's not writing in that language. He goes to the university there, Charles University, um, but he's doing so uh, by while writing in the German language. That in itself is interesting. Uh, the, the, the word Samza, by the way, uh, so the, high, the, the protagonist here is Gregor Samza. Samza in Czech uh, sounds like Samzia, uh, which means being alone. Fit description of this character who is very much alone in the context of his family to the point of being perceived as this uh, ungeheures ungeziefer, this monstrous vermin. Doesn't it sound better in German? <laughs> um, it rather does. It rather does, yeah. Um, and, and Kafka as a Jew in a Jewish um, uh, or in a German-speaking majority, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, had a sense of, of alienation just simply by virtue of being a Jew. Uh, he gravitated towards Zionism from Terror Herzl, the, the Judenstaat, the Jewish state. It was a, at that point a, just a, a, an, an ideal, a postulate. How do we unify Jewish identity given the experiences of Jews throughout the centuries and their, their uh, experiences and the idea that is that that would happen through a Jewish state and as Kafka grew older he became more devoted to that because of uh, the influence of, of various figures we can talk about that a little bit later on but um, 
it becomes really interesting and pertinent that he is Jewish. And uh, because this idea of being a vermin, which is at the heart of this novel, uh, the metamorphosis, uh, becomes the charge made against the Jews by the Germans after Kafka's desk under death under under the uh, under Nazism, where the Jews were called vermin, ungezifa, yep. this this very f- word, and uh, and and purged and dehumanized, and, and so it it also befits the Jewish experience in Europe at this time. But it, I think it more broadly describes the human condition under scientism. And, uh, and, and we can talk about that further, Bill, but I think there is a, a regulation of life, a bureaucracy which tries to make conditions for human life better by following science that unwittingly or perhaps in it, uh, or inadvertently, but perhaps uh, unvaryingly destroys our humanity. And, and so for that reason, people talk about Kafkaesque, not just talking about the 20th century, they will talk about it right now in the same way they'll talk about Orwellian right now. That condition has not gone away. So Kafka remains a very, uh, his, his concerns are very much close to home. Yeah, he wasn't a popular uh, author in his own time. Oh. Uh, never lived to see uh, his coming fame. And his fame really exploded, perhaps quite predictably, after World War II and the Holocaust and things like that. And so his Jewish identity is deeply bound up uh, with his reputation, with his literary reputation. And we can't lose sight of that. Um, There's a few other things we have to to note here. I I don't look at this through the lens of scientism like you do, though I can see how that is apt. Yeah, I I can see how scientism is an apt lens through which to look at the works of Kafka. For myself, I tend to uh, adopt more of the perspective of a bureaucratic totalitarianism, uh, which drowns its supplicants under endless forms and protocols and procedures of an impossibly pointlessly Byzantine nature. It's a way of killing dissent, uh, one pen stroke at a time. Um, and you get this sense of the claustrophobia in many of Kafka's stories that is ab- absolutely essential uh, to that adjective Kafkaesque. Um, the, the walls are closing in. You'll note here, even in the first couple of paragraphs, the walls are closing in on poor Gregor. Um, and in other places, Kafka writes in letters about how at times he felt the walls, the four walls were just closing in, not just on the man himself, but on his mental state and the way in which he viewed his world. So I think that's striking in teeth. Um, he never, as uh, he never really uh, gained the fame that uh, that he desired during his own lifetime. Of course, um, he uh, his work really comes to proper fame uh, only after uh, the end of World War II and the Holocaust. Uh, and so Jewish identity is deeply bound up with Kafka's reputation as well, and, and we can't really separate that. No. There's a few other things we should note here, particularly about Kafka and uh, uh, and the Metamorphosis. Um, his father was a, this set up Kafka's reputation and elements of his stories, uh, which uh, were very open, very fruitful for the fad of psycho analytic literary interpretation that swept through the postmodern world and still remains ensconced in the academy in certain places as well what what do you mean by that specifically sorry well his father was a traveling salesman so there's another crossover with our story here um but eventually he became uh the proprietor of a store um a very successful store in prague as it turns out but his father was a very, very domineering figure in Kafka's life. Uh, somebody who would just roll over uh, any opposition that dared raise uh, a finger toward. Uh, it was his His father was this larger than life figure who would just roll over anybody who dared to oppose him. Um, it was largely his father's influence that sent uh, Franz Kafka down the path of an insurance lawyer. Uh, it's not a job, it's not a career that he wanted, but it, uh, 
was a sensible choice that would put money uh, on the table, uh, came with a degree of job security and what have you. And it didn't matter if the future years of Kafka were largely miserable because of this, it was still the sensible thing to do and his father bullied him into it. But his father bullied everybody uh, in his immediate vicinity. This is a guy who you know, uh, had an opinion on most things and would, uh, would push and dominate until he got his way. So the father figure is a very central, very oppressive figure in most of Kafka's stories. Um, and as I said, this opens um, Kafka's literature up to a lot of Freudian psychoanalysis and literary inter interpretation from that school of thinking. A lot of that ha has been done. Uh, and that, of course, was a form of interpretation that was probably most in vogue in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So Kafka was a really, really popular um, author for academics to study at that time. Kafka himself likened writing to prayer. He needed absolute silence to do it. He saw it as kind of a holy kind of a vocation. Um, and if anybody disturbed him in the process, he became extremely upset because, like I said, he, he saw it as kind of a religious undertaking. As a young man, he was relatively indifferent to his Jewish identity, particularly his religious Jewish, Jewish identity. But then perhaps predictably, as he aged further, um, grew older, he became more and more fascinated with um, Yiddish theater, Jewish identity, Zionism. You've already mentioned Zionism. Uh, um, he was quite an active thinker when it came to uh, political activity, Jewish identity, and things like this later in his life. Uh, but of course, he died young. He died of tuberculosis in 1924. Um, in fact, it looks like he was at a sanatorium when he died in, I think it was June, uh, June 3rd of 1924. Yep. Uh, but he actually died of starvation because his throat was too um, agitated by the tuberculosis uh, for him to be able to eat. And so he, it's likely that he died of malnutrition, uh, I believe, while writing The Hunger Artist. Which right. Is he starves himself um, intentionally. So, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, a grotesque, uh, masochistic performance art. Um, so, uh, and we can talk maybe a little bit more about that presently. We should. Yeah. Uh, he was a socialist. When, he was a socialist when he was a young man, mm -hmm. um, but he seems to have moved away from that as he grew older. Um, he was engaged a number of times, I think at least four times in his life to be married, uh, but he never did marry ultimately. Uh, so he died single uh, like George Orwell. Um, and as I said before, he is a writer who injects a lot of his writing with biographical elements, which is why I'm dwelling on his biography as much as I do, because you simply can't separate the man's personal history from key motifs that he explores at great precise length in his stories. Mm. Uh, and unlike you, I've never had an opportunity to actually read Kafka in no. German. I've only read him in translation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're in a better position to speak to uh, the quality of his prose and his artistry as a, a literary craftsman. Um, I get the impression that he's like Orwell, he's competent, but he's not a striking artist like a Johnson or a Goethe or people like this or Kleist, perhaps. Um, that's, not, that's not his claim to fame. His claim to fame is that he dramatizes in, in powerful, insightful, unique, elaborate uh, ways with great precision the experience of the modernist artist in trying to engage with his world. Um, I sometimes think of him in sharp contrast to T.S. Eliot, who's largely engaged in the same kind of a project. Um, they, uh, they're, they're quite illuminating to consider in close proximity. Yeah, they are. Yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful and interesting. I, I, I do think that what you've said is really important and it's also correct. And what 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 he does and i said this already he traffics in archetypes and metaphors and for that reason um he he will naturally i think and almost invariably uh, appeal to um, social scientists and psychologists because they really largely traffic in the same sorts of things and freud is a great example of this but it, it seems to me the great sociologists and psychologists of the 20th century um, become great because they give this same sense of uh, giving a, a handle on reality in a way that novelists always did. But in the 20th century, because of scientism, I'm going to go back to my claim on this and try and defend it. Because of scientism, it becomes acceptable for the public to accept 
uh, the portrait of a psychologist or of a sociologist because it's scientific, uh, whereas they would have said it was just subjective if it were in, in the hands of a novelist. And, and so Kafkaesque, yes, for sure, but that's the fictional portrait. If you want the uh, scientific portrait, you have to go to a, a social scientist. You have to go to a Freud. You have to go to a William uh, James or a John Dewey or a, an Alfred Kinsey, who's you know using quasi-scientific studies to verify or reify what he's already uh, seen in his mind's eye, an image of human sexuality. And then he presents it in his studies. And people talk and they cite that as if that were proof positive of the image that he already has preconceived. And, and so I, I do think social sciences, and I have my questions about them, are, are successful insofar as they are really uh, giving us a, a mental image. And when I say scientism here, so I, I, threefold, and I'm going to draw directly from uh, Neil Postman's Technopoly here, uh, because I just think he presents it very uh, briefly what I would hold on this. First of all, the methods of natural sciences can be applied to human behavior as if they were observing something that could not change, just like they're observing, let's say, the laws of gravity. They'll say the same thing about what they observe. So it can be applied directly to human behavior. Secondly, there are specific principles that the social science generates that can be used to organize society on a rational and humane basis. And I think that's what the bureaucracy is there to do. But that's a belief of uh, scientism as well as that we can organize in a more humane way by the use of science. And thirdly, that faith in science can be comprehensive in, a, in presenting a belief system that gives us meaning to life. And what Kafka does is says that that project is actually antithetical to its avowed purposes. It doesn't give meaning to life. It robs us of meaning in life. It, it dehumanizes. It literally makes us into a monster uh, where the irony is actually the system is monstrous. It's the system of the social scientists that is dehumanizing, but it regards us as the monstrosity. That's his claim. And I think that it, he, he portrays that over and over and over down to the last days of his life when he becomes the hunger artist. And he, he at that point in that story, uh, the man is starving himself for the spectators. Well, in reality, as you said, he's suffering from TB. So he's probably not doing it intentionally. He can't eat. And he wants to give it a sort of a volition in a sense that he has control over his life where he has no control. He can't, he can't swallow and he's starving. He mm -hmm. dies not of the TB, but of the consequences of the TB. He's, he's starving. Um, but that, that sense of being uh, helpless in the face of the belief system of the, uh, the aristocrat, the aristocrat, the elite, the, uh, the social elite, the scientific elite, that's what he portrays in his novellas. And I, I admit that it leads to a totalitarian bureaucracy. There's no doubt about that. But I think totalitarian bureaucracies and scientism go hand in glove. Yeah, I would entirely agree with that. Yeah. Um, in some senses, I think they are inseparable. You've got a, a sort of environment built up gradually over a long time, um, which is a totalizing scientific, uh, bureaucratic sort of a context in which the, the, the character finds himself, the protagonist finds himself, or indeed Kafka found himself, which was built up in such a manner of science and bureaucracy to serve the, the, the human interests within that context. But what ends up happening is an inversion whereby the human and human value ends up serving the bureaucracy, the science, the system. And all of a sudden, uh, we you know, become the parasite and we serve it instead of it serving us. Um, and indeed, we have sort of a, a massive parasite, a vermin, if you will, in the story of the, the metamorphosis, um, which seems to, in this story here, be seen as uh, something which is endured only begrudgingly. Um, the, the, uh, the vermin in question, Gregor, is a burden to the people around him, to the world around him, to the, the matrix uh, of uh, social uh, operations in which he finds himself. 
and the resentment increases and increases and um, the vermin Gregor actually starves to death at the end of this story here as well. Yeah. Uh, this story, by the way, is written well before his death. Uh, it was probably written around 1912, published in 1915. Yep. Um, so it, it precedes um, the, he, indeed his diagnosis with tuberculosis. So yes. you can't read anything into that. No, it's just sort of, I, I mean, ironic uh, in the way it foreshadows his life. Yeah. Um, it also uh, precedes his deep dive into his Jewish identity and his beginning of learning about uh, so he starts to learn Hebrew and he starts to learn about Zionism and he starts to be drawn towards the Hasidic uh, tradition, uh, a more pious version of Judaism. Um, and this, this sort of uh, committed identity, uh, religious identity is something that he, he grows towards as time goes by. And he, he's moving away from the sense of alienation that he expresses here in the Metamorphosis. Um, but he never wholly escapes that feeling of alienation, his sense of Jewish identity, uh, which he's trying to uh, grow into, I think, never allows him to escape the dilemma of being uh, a monster in the midst of uh, Prague. And uh, he's yeah, led along it's... that path. Sorry, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, he, we've been talking a lot about his Jewish identity and how this is kind of core to the author himself, and it is. Um, but I think there's also an interesting thing that sometimes gets lost in translation with Kafka studies, which is that he's describing a modernist experience uh, of life, whether this be scientific, bureaucratic, what have you, um, a, an experience of absurdity, an experience of nihilism, an experience of alienation, which most people living in the modernist period could identify, identify with Jewish or not. Um, so there was an immediate kind of a resonance with that. We also have to remember that one of the sort of uh, hallmarks, one of the identifying features of the modernist mentality is an excruciating self-consciousness, which oftentimes be uh, means that the protagonist is kind of self-defeating. Many people have said this about Kafka himself. Many of the protagonists in his stories are painfully, excruciatingly self-conscious, um, uh, shy, uh, they, they find themselves grotesquely underwhelming. Um, they fail to take the great leap. Uh, in this sense, many of his protagonists have a lot in similar, uh, a lot, uh, sorry, a lot in common with uh, characters like Proofrock. Proofrock is excruciatingly self-conscious, so much so that it becomes self-defeating and he oh. gives up. He doesn't even make the effort to do the thing, to, to ask the question, to push the moment. Um, so they're very much of a piece here. And if you've read around your modernist authors long enough, you'll realize there are a very large number of protagonists who are exactly that. They, they are alienated, self-conscious, self-loathing individuals. There's something vaguely masochistic about them. Um, let, me stop, let me stop they, you they there. Go let, ahead. Me stop, let me stop you there. You said masochistic. Yes. Let's dig down on that word here and, and talk about how it directly connects to the beginning of the novel. Can yeah. you say something about that? Yeah, there is a portrait on the wall that Gregor, as a giant vermin, he's, which is oftentimes portrayed as a cockroach. It doesn't actually say that in the no, story. No, it doesn't. Um, but his, his sister is trying to remove all the things that clutter up the room because uh, as a bug, he likes crawling around on the walls and ceiling and stuff like this. Uh, but she tries to take this portrait out and he defends this portrait of this woman wearing furs viciously is described there in that second paragraph. Um, and this connects to um, much of the early thinking that's being pioneered right around this time. Um, I believe his last name is Masoch. Is that right? Masoch. Um, yeah. Yeah. Leopold this is, uh, this... Sachs or Masoch. Yeah. Yeah. So this guy did a lot of pioneering work psychologically, socially, et cetera, et cetera, with the sexualization of what you and I would now call masochism. It's literally named after the man himself. And he talks extensively his works about uh, a particular portrait, Venus in Furs, I think it's called, or something that's, like this. That's it. Um, so people say that in the metamorph. Yeah. Um, so people will say that there's no, um, there are obviously powerful relationships at play in this novella, but none of them are overtly sexual. In point of 
fact, you've got uh, him clinging to this masochistic portrait on the wall uh, in, in a sense that seems uh, desperate, sexually laden, all these sorts of things. There is something I've never really been able to put my finger on it, but there's something deeply disturbing with his obsession, his need to preserve that portrait, to hang on to that, to cling to that masochistic portrait um, as his sister tries to clear out the room. Um, but definitely it's, it's not a, it's, it's not a coincidence that that's the portrait that hangs on his wall. Um, so it, it is a sort of a, um, a commitment to a, I mean, how would we define masochism? So it's associated with this figure, uh, but masochism is a sort of self, uh, abasement, a sort of, uh, self loathing, a sexual, yeah. Um, a sexual, um, I don't know what, what we would call it. I'm not a psychologist, but a, um, it's a hostility. It's a hostility to the self the body. that yeah. manifests in numerous different ways. It, 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 it can inflict itself uh, on the body, this hostility. So self-harm or getting others to harm the, the, the self physically, but it can also be social harm, um, psychological harm, emotional harm. Uh, can take almost any sort of form, and it is usually, in some sense, sexualized. That's how, as you say. You know, neither you nor I are social scientists, so uh, we're not the experts on this. But that's my kind of brief understanding of masochism. Kafka himself was extremely self-conscious about his body. Um, did not like looking at himself in the mirror. Um, didn't like himself in many different respects. Um, and was also a, an extremely sexually active individual. He frequented brothels and things like that. He had numerous affairs with many different women. So sex is oftentimes on the brain of Kafka. And he's also very negative about uh, his own body, about sex itself. He was very self-conscious about that too, looked upon it with disgust and yet was drawn to it again and again. There's, there's a powerful sort of psychological loop going on in Kafka's mind, and this plays out in certain ways, sometimes awkward, uh, in his writing. There's a lot of masochism uh, in his writing, more generally speaking. We see this with the penal colony and things like that, and uh, the trial also and stuff uh, of that sort. So it's, a, it's, not just, it's not frustrated sexual desire. It's sort of a self-loathing um, analysis of why sexual desire can't be met. There's something in uh, his nature which prevents him from ever achieving any sort of sexual, and it's not gratification, but sense of completion. Um, and, and so he is, as you say, protecting this Venus in furs. And again, the, the work by Masoch is Venus in pelts, in, and it's literally Venus in furs. And Venus, of course, the goddess of love. How does that connect to the metamorphosis? Well, Ovid's metamorphosis is about a whole series of gods, um, amorous gods, falling in love with various nymphs, dryads, whatever, uh, sometimes human beings, and having some sort of a sexual union with them, at which point they then metamorphosize into something else. Here we have Kafka metamorphosized already at the beginning of the inception of the novel in the form of this, this monstrous vermin, um, this ungeheuer, this ungeziefer. That's what he is already. And so he's, he's already been metamorphosized and the Venus in furs that he looks about, he wants some sort of union with this, but again, he's alienated by the fact that he is already a monstrosity. There's no fitting uh, object for his desires because he is already um, beyond repair in this sense. So it is almost, it's not an expression of sexual frustration as, as Freud would identify it, but a sense of sexual, um, uh, what we would say, what we say, it's not that he's been neutered even. He's been made uh, non-human. He's been made into a monstrosity. There is, yeah. can be yeah. no completion for him. And if you want, want to take it as a religious metaphor, there is no um, fit object of our love in a broader sense. So in the Christian, you talk about eros and then mm -hmm. agape. There's nothing of that here. There's no ultimate object here. There is no proximate object. There's no, there isn't even eros is impossible for him. Yeah, he's powerfully drawn, very powerfully drawn to a sexual act which disgusts him at numerous levels. 
with himself. So this, I think, is at the core of his. Yeah, he's, he's he's disgusted with himself. He's disgusted with the sexual act, even as he's drawn to it, and it, the disgust becomes part of the attraction. And he is a disgusting vermin. I mean, that's that's uh, how they start this uh, all off. It all fits together. Um, Kafka and uh, we know from Kafka's bio, he was disgusted with himself. Um, uh, this is one of the reasons he was so shy in social circles, in spite of his promiscuity and things like this. Uh, a lot of people said he was very shy in conversations. He wasn't uh, somebody who would assert himself socially. That was his father. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of a polar opposite of his father's personality in that respect. Uh, people did say that when he did speak, he would oftentimes say profound things. He could be quite uh, humorous, quite funny. So they never got the sense that he was an embarrassment to be around. But Kafka himself writes about it all over the place in his letters and things like this. By the way, I should mention here that he uh, estimates of uh, how much of his own literature he destroyed run up to about 90% of his writings. Only about 10%, they say, has survived. I don't know if that's dependable and how you would actually track that. But just for the sake of discussion, I just want to put that out there, too. So there, there is some sense in which his, his, self of, his sense of self-disgust um, and self-defeat also has a literary angle to it as well. He's destroying his work continuously. What did survive, his good friend and executor, Max Broad, uh, was instructed to destroy. Uh, Kafka told him, destroy the rest of my remaining literature. Um, and luckily, Broad did not pay attention to that after the death of Kafka, which is why we have what we have. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, but as far as his masochism, Again, here's a quote. Sometimes I feel I understand the fall of man better than anyone because he sees in himself a continual uh, illustration of the fall of man. He, he has a, a, a visceral self-loathing of every aspect of his own being. And um, nonetheless, Broad, and I would say also his English translator, Edwin Muir, um, see him as a religious writer and they want to draw him towards a, a Jewish Christian identity. And I'm not, some, some people have objected to this. And, and I think there's legitimate grounds for the objection. Um, it, it's hard to say how Christian or Jewish Kafka's fiction is when he sees no, I mean, there's no obvious Jewish nature to Kafka's experience. It, it's, it's maybe a Jew in Prague at this time, uh, in a sense of dislocation, uh, cutting off from a, a, any sort of rootedness. Um, and it, it does seem to reflect human experience in general, but I don't see how this is explicitly specifically Christian or Jewish for that matter. I just don't, I just simply don't see it. I do see it as human, yep. for sure. Human alienation, <clears throat> yes. And insofar as Jewish and Christian expresses that, maybe expresses it well, if not better, then okay, perhaps, but it, it, we don't get any, so there's no sense of the importance of, if it were Christian, the incarnation, or of the crucifixion, or of the ascension, or of the resurrection, there's none of, there's no themes of resurrection in Kafka, there's none. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's nihilistic self, self-loathing that you yes. encounter again and again, as the person struggles on a horrific quest against uh, the machinations of an unfeeling world, it's bureaucrats, and it's scientists, and, and people like this, it might be Jewish in the sense that Woody Allen is Jewish, right? It might be sent in that sure. sense. There's sort of a self-deprecating, self-loathing, uh, sexually promiscuous individual living in a big city. Okay. But in, in that sense of a Jewish, is that really, a, is there anything particularly Jewish about it? In, I th I've always or, thought of Kafka, uh, Kafka's approach to anything spiritual or religious, very much like uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare um, is studious in, making his own religious life views values opaque be vanished the, i mean it's really hard, hard to say anything concrete about the the faith of shakespeare uh, based on his works i think you could say the same thing about jewish identity with the works of kafka does it at several removes exert a powerful influence on him i suspect it probably does um but to go mining through his oftentimes byzantine stories looking for it I think is, is oftentimes relatively fruitless. Um, we should mention, or I should mention another thing here as well, which is that uh, Kafka has, Kafka is good ground for academic research in the postmodern period. Mm. Um, and maybe even where we're at right now. Um, 
And to this, uh, to that extent, uh, he has basically licensed his writings have facilitated endless uh, academic research and PhDs. And so there are all kinds of theories out there about Kafka and what his work represents, what it actually does, um, how it actually fits into uh, the wider uh, trajectory of 20th century literature. And a lot of these theories themselves, impossibly Byzantine. Um, and bureaucratic. And <laughs> yeah, and bureaucratic, exactly. Like it, it, it sounds like sometimes like you're reading Habermas or somebody like this. Um, <laughs> that arch bureaucrat of postmodernism. Um, when you actually decipher what's being said by way of theories about him, you realize that that's not terribly plausible. The evidence is sketchy. The logic is not terribly strong. Um, so you have to be really careful about theorizing about Kafka, much more so than a lot of other 20th century writers, because so many people have such strong, wild, lurid opinions about his work and about the man himself. So I tend to have my guard up all the way through my Kafka experience. No, I think it's fair enough. Um, so do we want to say anything more here? Do we want to dig down on in, into the work itself? Um, when he was writing in his, in his diary, when he's writing the metamorphosis, he, he says this, I'm living with my family, the dearest people, and yet I am more estranged from them than from a stranger. I mean, if, if you can't see that as an autobiographical reflection, I don't know what you could. I mean, it's clearly he's writing about himself. And in general, I think you and I are going to strongly dissent from a tradition that sees authors as just projecting their own experiences into their writing. I don't yes. think we really can do that with Kafka when he so openly uh, identifies himself with his protagonists. Yeah, uh, this in, process in... becomes... Go ahead. No, 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 I'm done. This process becomes point blank explicit with a lot of later writers and uh, the, the reigning queen of imposing personal biography on literary output is of course um, your favorite poet of the 20th century, Sylvia Plath, um, who actually popularizes a form of poetry which dominates the scene to this very day, confessional poetry. It's called confessional poetry because you share oftentimes cringeworthy, painful, excruciating aspects of your personal experience with your audience, the audience of your poetry. Uh, but Kafka's, so Kafka's in good company in the 20th century. We spend a lot of time, authors spend a lot of time, protagonists spend a lot of time in, in 20th century literature uh, staring into the mirror and not in a positive sense. This is not, if it is narcissism, it's very, a, a very dark form of narcissism. Uh, so Kafka is an excellent fit with that uh, 20th century tendency. Um, I should enough. also so, mention here that because, go ahead. No, no. So fair enough. He, and, and so he, to some degree, although he doesn't, he wouldn't identify it as confessional, um, but we, uh, uh, the tradition will see it as confessional in a sense. Whereas the later writers, I really think would identify it as confessional. They're unabashed about it. And it becomes legitimized as probably as the discipline of psychology becomes legitimized as a science, which I dispute, by the way. But as it becomes the gains the mantle of respectability or even of imperious uh, factuality, this the psychological disciplines, uh, confessional literature then gains uh, credibility, uh, whereas before it would not have been credible, respectable, uh, or really uh, anything other than seen as disgusting to write about yourself in your fiction, unless you're writing something uh, like a Confessions of Augustine. Um, but the purpose of that is entirely yeah. different than a modern Confessions a la Rousseau and company, right? Yeah, um, one of you, you know, the impression that you get reading something like, as you say, Augustine's Confessions is you have moments of, of recognition and um, identification with what seemed to be Augustine's personal experience. You think as you're reading about this, um, ah, this is like me too. I, I too have undergone that crisis. I too had to untangle that web of, of questions around that issue and what have you. Um, you don't get that sense with a lot of 20th century writers when they're writing something of a confessional biogra autobiographical nature. Uh, um, it's quite different. Used to, it used to be that one of the marks of whether or not you were writing legitimate 
worthwhile literature was how well your works of literature fit into the great conversation, the great books that had gone before. Are you actually talking about the same sort of things that have us all concerned about the human condition and man's place in God's universe and stuff like this? Um, so in some senses, you, you, you wanted to walk and talk like the best of those who had gone before. But increasingly in the 20th century, we find that most people actually haven't read many or even most or indeed any of those books. So how would you know whether or not uh, this current work fits in in a productive way into the wider tradition of Western literature and Western art? You don't know that. Um, so you have to fall back on different metrics, metrics which I would argue with Kafka uh, can lead you down re uh, relatively unproductive paths sometimes. Okay, go ahead and say more about this because, because we're, we're now getting into the meat of our disagreement about why we should be looking at Kafka in this series. No, really. Yeah. This is a legitimate critique because we, we've said throughout that we see it, we're presenting great books and there is a sort of a continuity of human concerns. They develop for sure over time. They gain uh, focus and to some degree uh, in conversation with one another. Is Kafka in conversation with anyone? Well, this, is, is he only writing what, about yeah. himself? This is one of the things I find most frustrating about Kafka, and that's how I would typify it. I'm, I'm frustrated with him. Uh, he talks extensively about how his guiding luminaries in the literary world and in literary endeavor are these great writers, writers like Dostoevsky, uh, uh, Gogol, Flaubert, Goethe. Um, he, I mean, he, he's naming the right names uh, and no doubt about it. Um, he Indeed, he learns languages in order to read some of these greats. Um, he wanted to read Flaubert in the original French, so he goes off and he learns French. Um, and he also, so, so that's going into the tradition of Kafka and what he's doing in theory. Um, and then on the other end, after his death and after World War II, after the Holocaust, Kafka becomes wildly popular, uh, establishes a tremendous ringing reputation in the 20th century. And he, in turn, influences all these major critics and writers and what have you. Nabokov is huge on him. Harold Bloom writes about him extensively. Um, there are some real big somebodies in the literary world, either writers or academics, who are profoundly influenced, at least in theory, by Kafka. And yet, and here we come to the heart of my resentment, when I read Kafka himself, and maybe it's because I'm reading the, him in translation, I just don't see in any meaningful way, for the most part, how his work is connecting to the great works and the great conversation that came before and how it contributes something productive to what came after him in the literary world. Kafka is representative of a culture, yes. Uh, he's, he's representative of a certain artistic movement that locates itself in the modernist period. I have to remember here, modernism violently rejected all tradition starting with people like Lytton Strachey and these guys here, um, they cut themselves off from history. They cut themselves off from cultural history, artistic history, all these sorts of things. They did it knowingly. They did it deliberately. They looked back upon their past with a fair amount of contempt and disgust and, and even hatred. Um, these things had brought them to the nightmare of the Great War and all this stuff. And so it was with intense disgust that they pushed all those traditions away from them. And remember what the, the slogan they adopted amongst many writers in the 20th century, make it new, make it new, make it new out of what? Ex nihilo, out of, I don't know what, so stuff that came randomly to hand out of my own personal biography. Um, so these are people who cut themselves off for history. And then when we get to the postmodernists, one of the things I see as kind of a dividing point between modernists and postmodernists is that the modernists reject the great conversation. The postmodernists don't really even know it anymore. They've forgotten it. It's been written out of their history. So you can make a reference back to Augustine or Spencer or Shakespeare or Milton, and they just stare at you blankly and then go back into their vitriolic screed against such things that they don't fully understand. Uh, so this is kind of at the heart of my resentment of Kafka. Yeah, and so they begin with Speak the phrase something like, zone. as we already know, and then uh, yeah. they'll be right. And so there's a, the conclusion of an argument that they've never made because they never were in the position to have made the judgment, which they begin with as the basis for now we can go on to what I want to talk about. Right. But that's postmodernism. Yeah, it, it's, it's true. It, is that true of Kafka is the question. And I don't think it is. I think he, he, I mean, already 
by calling it metamorphosis, by portraying Venus in furs, by alluding to this frustrated or perverse sexual uh, motif um, as the foundation of it. He's, he is describing his culture. He's describing his age. Okay, fair enough. Does that qualify him for inclusion in the great tradition as a dialogue there? Um, I think it's not fair just because of what post Second World War authors do with him. These uh, these narcissists like Harold Bloom and and others, uh, Nabokov, um, who also want to cite the influence of Kafka, so that they can be narcissists just like he is. Well, that's inadequate. I don't think that I don't think that Kafka is doing that. Actually, I think he is citing the dislocation. I think at least we can have the conversation about how he relates to the past because of the fact that he does engage with it. However, frustratingly, however, I, I think it doesn't go anywhere after him. I think it dies. The tradition dies when Kafka won't let it live on and sees it as being effectively well, stillborn. For, for somebody who lives in this sort of nihilistic bureaucratic universe, such as Kafka seems to, um, the notion of altruism is a completely foreign idea. I mean, and this is, this is key to understanding, I think, this story here, but it's also key to understanding Kafka himself. Uh, note what I say when I'm talking about his connection. I mean, obviously, the metamorphosis is a reference back to Ovid's metamorphosis and all that goes along with that. Um, but what interests me is whether he connects and draws from that literary past in a way that's productive, that in a way that's, that's in some sense beneficial in an artistic and human sense to his readers. And I'm not sure he does. And that's, it's the, it's that I lack agree. of productive connection that, I agree. that, that, that makes me cranky. He's wasted all this stuff. He's taken it up. He's learned it. He's, he's incorporated bits and pieces of it to no particularly useful end or no particularly valuable artistic end, I would argue. Now, there's plenty of people who will disagree with me, of course. No, I actually think um, you're right. I actually fact, think I am you're right. In the minority. No, no, I okay. think you're right. I mean, the, the, the character of Gregor Samza, Samza, again, Samzia, he's alone. He's delight, he delights in dirt. He takes food as, as only a pastime. The, all these yep. dislocated experiences, of, um, disconnected of any meaning, dehumanized as he is, they're just part of his normal. It's the new normal. And, and so he portrays this horrible state uh, and there is no hope that comes out of it. I agree with that. I, I, I think that is Kafka-esque. What is alarming is that we use the phrase or the, this term Kafka-esque to describe a horror scenario, but then culturally there is no um, movement on the part of the artists to move away from the nihilism of the Kafka-esque portrait. They are just, in a sense, uh, delighting in this. Uh, yeah, they, they embrace it with kind of a masochistic fervor. Um, and, and so in that sense, I suppose that, you know, insofar as Kafka's stories involve an element of self-identity, then when these other narcissistic masochists come across his work, it allows them to identify with that same sort of mentality. They too do see something that they recognize. There are moments of recognition, just as you and I might have had moments of recognition with Augustine's biography. So also they have moments of recognition and association with, with the, the events and the characters that they're, with Kafka. He is like me and, and we're celebrating this in some kind of inverted, twisted sense. It's like the sexual appeal um, of masochism, the sexual appeal that, uh, 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 of something that that same person finds disgusting so that the disgusting element becomes the attractive element, becomes the disgusting element. You're in a cycle, a horrible cycle. Um, so I think maybe that has some explanatory power as to the fame of Kafka, but uh, I, I find it deeply unsettling. Even it is as deeply I, I think unsettling. it's important, I find it unsettling. Yeah. Uh, so do I. Um, <laughs> but 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 so, I, so a, I, I don't have Kafka on my list of great writers um, for any reason other than I think he identifies what becomes characteristic of much of contemporary fiction. Uh, this yeah. oppressive, perverse. Um, as I said, uh, um, also this solipsistic uh, and, and narcissistic view in, in which the reading public actually isn't even reading what they're writing either. Um, no. 
and, and they celebrate one another, allowing them to continue on with their narcissism. Well, we like your narcissism. How about if you celebrate us doing our narcissism? And I think, well, actually, nobody wants to read any of your narcissisms. <laughs> it's, yeah, it becomes an echo chamber of narcissists. Um, as they feed each other back and forth. Uh, in, again, it's a grotesque cycle. I, and this is why, you know, I think that if we are going to read Kafka, and I think your average student of literature should read Kafka, if you do read Kafka, it should be very much in the same spirit as reading Orwell. Um, they speak to a particular artistic and intellectual point in history, um, and they're illuminating as such. But I would read them very much in the same spirit as I would read B.F. Skinner or John Dewey or uh, yeah, that's exactly uh, you know, it. these individuals. Um, I'm not doing it for aesthetic pleasure. I'm not doing it to be enriched as a human being. Uh, I'm doing it to become informed um, about where we currently find ourselves. That's why well, I'm doing it. Go to a on the other hand, I think he'll be read for centuries to come. But Orwell and Kafka, I could see these guys fading away over time as they become less and less relevant to the moment. And, and your voice faded away over time, as you said, faded away over time. That's probably interesting. I, I agree with you. And, and so if we wanted to connect Kafka to these, the great themes of the good, the true, and the beautiful, there's nothing good in this per se. No, there's nothing no. true in a, in a transcendental sense. Uh, it might be true of his experience in a sense and in conveying it in images that we recognize as having a certain power. And there's certainly nothing beautiful. It's ugly. Uh, and, and he doesn't seek to do anything other than that. So it, it's almost, it does, it's sort of an illustration of the futility of the narcissism of the artistic movement in the 20th century. Uh, that's what it is. And, and so it, 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 yeah. it, with that frustration, which you sense, and I share the same experience, it pushes me back to where can I find the good and the true and the beautiful in art, which I think is the reason why people read it and always have read it and want to hold on to it and want to pass it down to future generations and say, these are the things that we've inherited. We want you to be educated in the same way. Uh, so Kafka is a great illustration of, here's what happens if you don't do that. <laughs> you end up being like Kafka. I don't mean yeah. in your it's... personal life, but it could be in your personal life, but certainly in a sense of having no horizon of hope yeah, Kafka fits in very well to the modernist and postmodernist aesthetic. We see all these sorts of things being turned out in the name of art, which are grotesque. Um, and indeed, the grotesque seems to be more common in, in celebrated works of art in the 20th century as we go on, more than what you and I would conventionally call the beautiful. Um, I am, you know, uh, struck by loathing and disgust by a lot of the things that are written, painted, sculpted, performed, um, insofar as they identify with the modernist and postmodernist culture out of which they are sprung. Um, and Kafka fits into that well. There's an aesthetic of disgust and oftentimes self-disgust that is a, kind of at the, at the core of it here. Um, and I think if you know traditional art and traditional literature and you're conversant in it and you've been trained to appreciate it, then you can safely look at this with uh, indeed a, a spasm of revulsion and think, my goodness, this compares very badly indeed. Maybe that's the point. It's very dramatic. Is it an artistic experience? No, it's like the inversion of an artistic experience. But, you know, by way of contrast, by way of binary opposition, maybe it's somehow useful to read this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, how we break out of that cycle in Western art and Western literature. So uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I think we're in agreement actually on, on Kafka and where that ends. Um, and uh, the only thing I, I think where I disagreed and it was going back a little bit is when, you're, is when you made reference to Shakespeare and his, um, his religious re terms of reference and so forth. I think that Shakespeare is actually a profoundly uh, Christian writer. And even though we may not know his uh, churchmanship in his novels or his novels, his drama or his poetry, uh, 
there's a Christian worldview that's sh is shot throughout all of his writing. And it is explicit in certain works like Measure for Measure, I think his Christianity is, is patent for the reader to see uh, and elsewhere. But there's a, a sense of purpose and meaning. There's a, in the, in the tragedies, um, evil arises and it is punished in a, in a very decisive way at the conclusion. In his comedies, evil is present and threatens the good, but ultimately um, it is thwarted and it ends in a sort of a union, a happy ending. There's a marriage, again, a decisive uh, orderly universe, which reflects the view that God superintends the universe and holds everything in uh, an orderly fashion and brings it and brings good out of evil. Um, and I don't think we get that in anything like in the 20th century. So I, I recognize and admit there's something that we don't know about Shakespeare's Christianity in the sense it's not overt in his writing the way it is in Milton. We do know that he was an Anglican and he remained in the Anglican church to the end of his days. And I think there are other hints at that, but that would take us far away from the topic here at hand. Um, whereas Kafka, I, I think his, his uh, Judaism or Jewishness is far more inchoate. It's far more difficult to see how he even qualifies as a, as a Jewish writer, aside from his uh, wanting to find an identity in it. He doesn't have any identity in the terms of the themes of the Jewish uh, religion per se. I just don't see them. Um, he's not drawing upon Old Testament um, archetypes in his patterns of stories that they're, they're just not there. So he's not a Jewish writer in that sense. He is a Jew, I guess, dislocated in Prague as part of an exiled community or something like that, longing for another country. Okay, well, there, that, that is perhaps a theme of sorts, longing for another country, not having one being in exile. You could say, say that, but he doesn't really use that as a dominant theme. It's more, again, the sense of self-loathing. Well, it's not particularly Jewish. It really is not in, in a historical or at least in a biblical sense. Yeah, it's right? the, the thing. I mean, I, uh, first of all, I, I'll grant that certainly Shakespeare's worldview is profoundly Christian. I think pretty well everybody's was from uh, in that period Fair and location. Um, but he's uh, I don't think uh, the key word for me there is overt. Shakespeare is not overt about a lot of his personal values and what have you. You can infer them from the developments, thematic developments in his plays and his poetry. Uh, but nothing is ever explicit, as it is, for instance, uh, you, you mentioned Milton there. I think that's a good point of comparison. The difficulty with Jewish worldview is that, you know, it's maybe because of the diaspora or maybe other factors that factor into this uh, uh, an incredibly complex and vexed uh, history. You can't point to a unified worldview and say, aha, that's a Jewish lens through which he is seeing things. That may be one of many different Jewish lenses that very problematically fit together. Uh, but Jewish identity is, is very different in that sense. And if we have Jewish listeners to us, I, I look forward to your comments. I'm not an expert on these things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's fishing for anything Jewish in Kafka is is uh, in my mind and i think you, know, you were in agreement on this uh, your mind as well it's it's rather fruitless there's not much point to it um did we have anything more to say about kafka no i mean we didn't get into the novel as much as we could have we dealt with more of the themes and the archetypes and the yeah. way in which the story is emblematic of the of the period and i still think that remains the dominant interest of kafka for for me, the story displays all that and the, the biographical elements can be, if you read anything about Kafka's biography, his relation to his parents and his sister, yeah. you can see them in the story as well. But we don't need to elucidate them here on in this episode and we can leave others to do that. I think what we've uh, meditated on uh, is helpful and probably different from what you'll find on websites, for instance, or synopsis is mm -hmm. online um and and fair enough um but i think that's about it really for me um and i'm i'm glad to conclude this chapter on kafka which i've inflicted on you in a sort of sadistic way and you've <laughs> indulged in a masochistic way for us bill um yeah kicking and screaming all the way screaming and feeling like a 
<laughs> Ungeziefer. Um, <laughs> and uh, but we're going to move on to better things next time. We'll come to yeah, Mr. Sure. Tolkien, right? Is that not right? Say something more, Bill. And yeah, so uh, J.R.R. Tolkien is our, uh, our next stop on the journey of Paideia. Um, and of course, uh, his writings are uh, extremely diverse. Um, and his works of literature, I do see as fitting quite elegantly into the great conversation, unlike quite a number of individuals we're discussing from the 20th century. So I'm very much looking forward to that. We, uh, Dr. Masson and I have uh, paced ourselves in our reading selections um, in season four here, and we agreed that we would do a harrowing author or two, and then we'd give ourselves a break. And so we spaced them right. So if you're not seeing a lot of chronological sequencing here this is one of the reasons we have to come up for air every now and again so tolkien is going to allow us to do that take a deep breath before we dive back under the murky waters of postmodernism mm -hmm. so ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us i am dr bill friesen joined by my colleague as always dr scott masson thank you for listening and take care bye for now <laughs>